What's happened? What kind of place is this? Maybe I'm dead. I can't see any light. I might be dead. I can't get up. What's going on here? What's happening to me? There's no one here. Yet, these noises... God, my head is killing me. I can't keep my eyes open.
The only thing I remember clearly is Charlotte, my doll. No, no, she's freezing. She's alone. Let's look for her. It is not forbidden. Let's find Charlotte. Renee does not want to abandon her. Mummy took good care of Charlotte. She tucked her in, hugged her, gave her cuddles and kisses. She was very affectionate and loving. Nothing bad happened to Charlotte, and I was amazed. I did not understand. At first I was quite afraid. I feared that she wanted to hurt me. I was constantly expecting the moment when Mum would abandon her. Because I did not deserve to live. I did not deserve to be loved. It's cold. It's dark. Now she's cold. She'll get ill. We can take care of her. It's not forbidden. Charlotte is a good girl. Those lamps might make the room warmer, but Charlotte's uncomfortable. She doesn't feel well. Charlotte is cold. Let's find her a warm place.
He doesn't want to. Not Charlotte. He'll get angry. He'll certainly get angry. I saw a wheelchair on the ground floor. It's a convenient place and we can get Charlotte into a warm place. This is a comfortable place for Charlotte. But it's cold. No, no, it's cold. Don't shiver, Charlotte. The cold will go away. We need to find warm lights. Let's go into the surgical ward. The cold goes away, you see? The light. Warmth. We can do it. The cold goes away. It's not forbidden. Now we can go to that ward where everything started. It all began in the observation ward on the ground floor.
light, but it didn't go dark. It was a limitless immensity, a blinding, merciless light. I was 16 and I was afraid, always afraid, a fear that wore me down. I needed help, but I could not speak. Everything terrified me, even thinking. They said they were taking me to a place where the fear would go away, where I would get better. I stopped living in there. They dragged me away and tore off all of my clothes, every last stitch. I tried to explain what was going on in my head. They tied me to the bed for days, alone with my nightmares. It wasn't fear anymore. It was madness. And when you're mad, you cease to exist. She was my only hope in this hell. I was falling down amongst the damned, but that woman and her smile kept me alive. The door is locked from the outside. Here, the doors can only be locked and unlocked from the outside. He laughed, panted, lurched over me. It hurt when he touched me. I thought I'd split apart suddenly with a loud thud, shattered into pieces. I felt fragile, sick, dirty, filthy. All I could do was clutch Charlotte tightly while he... Rene obeyed. He was the boss in the realm of light. 
I was devoured by the evil I had done. I threw up and could feel hell getting closer and closer. My god, those medical examinations. The doctors said there was something inside me, which they would have dragged out of me. My god. She stayed with Renee during those terrible medical examinations. That's what gave her the strength to survive. They went to the gynecology ward on the first floor. Confidential. Dear A, I know what you think about these things, so I am referring a patient to you, Renee T. This wretched girl eluded our control and caused trouble in the park almost three months ago. The nurses should pay more attention. I'm examining the girl on the 28th. I'll sort things out. Don't worry. We don't want to make things any worse. 
Then they said that Renee was crazy and that the illness was all in her head. Be careful, little girl. Be careful. I was scared and I didn't talk to anyone about the illness. Only her. Not even the other doctor. He never touched Renee. He just wrote things down. You can tell me everything. Don't be afraid, he said. Everything's going to be fine. Do you want to know what I'm writing? I write down what I see about you. Everything I see. He didn't hate Renee. He tried to help her. But he rarely examined her in those small surgeries. The doctor who wrote things down was in surgery C. Twelfth March, 1938. Renee T., 16 years old, Menarche at the age of 12, housewife, father unknown, mother a seamstress. Admitted for observation yesterday morning from Pontedera, accompanied by a police officer authorized by the examining magistrate of the Court of Pisa to be admitted for psychiatric evaluation, which has been executed by me. Medical certificate. Mental illness preceded by warning signs. Has suffered from depression for a year, believing she has tuberculosis. Food deprivation. We shouldn't read this document. It's forbidden. We mustn't. If they find out, there'll be trouble. The park, at the back and then down towards the kitchens. This is the road we used to take. If she hadn't been there, in the park on that bench in spring for all those days. It was like escaping nature. She talked and smiled. And then there were the kitchens. Sometimes we stole something to eat and went straight back to the bench to eat it in secret and we laughed. She did things to me. Sometimes she touched me. In the showers, I felt her body against mine for the first time. It was a shiver that warmed my soul. Eyes closed. The light slipped away.
She wasn't in the system. He wouldn't let her in. That's it. She must be the key. The key to my memories. To the reasons why. The scent of spring. The land of light was far away and we spent the days chatting, seated on the stone benches. Let's look for Amara in the kitchens in the basement of the building, behind the greenhouse. Come on, come on, let's search everywhere. She must be here, without a doubt. Adele, that little girl has been there, motionless in front of the kitchens for hours. Poor thing. I gave her a sweet. She ate it without saying a word and remained there still. I don't think she's well. We used to see her now and again. Now she's always there. I'm off. The doctor's not here. He'll be here in the afternoon. Try and speak to him. Poor thing. Lost in her dreams. She was only a little girl, but nobody gave her a cuddle. On the contrary, they punished her. They said she was ill. Her dreams were bothersome. Even her dreams weren't hers anymore. I need her. But we will find her. We'll find her, won't we? When the water in the shower was cold, we ran away. But when it was hot, then she came to Renee. Under that cruel white light, I can still feel the shivers that her body gave me. It all has to go back to how it was. If we recreate that magic, she'll come to us.
We'll have to turn on the water in the shed. Everything's ready. ready. We can go, we to, can the go showers. to the showers. We can go we can along, go along, that, along that, that corridor, corridor in the kitchen. kitchen. We'll meet her in, in the, the shower showers. showers. Everything's ready. Let's strip off and leave our clothes on the hooks in the changing room.
Let's now turn on the water and everything will be as it once was. She existed no longer. I should have liked to cancel everything I used to do. And instead, I always did it again. It was my fault, and then she disappeared from my life. There they gave you those injections which made your body and soul tremble violently. A whirlwind of anguish and unsupportable pain. I lived on terror of the next time. They had taken me upstairs into that ward where no one wanted to go. When there was too much chaos, they closed all the windows in the door. They switched off the lights and it was pitch black. Some people fell asleep. Some others stopped seeing their demons and things became more peaceful. Montefascoli, 20th December, 1941. Dear Director, Please let me know how my daughter, your patient Renee T, is doing. I've written to my daughter several times, but without getting any reply. I'm very worried, and since I've been ill for some time, and I'm not fit to come and visit her. Please do me the favor of letting me know when it will be possible for me to bring my daughter home. Your humble servant, Ada T. Bring this letter to the attention of Dr. C so he can evaluate the possible discharge of the patient. Let's look for Renee's room in the semi-agitated ward.
Let's close the window shutters, the door, and switch off all the lights. We want darkness. They put a straight jacket on you. They gave you a cold shower. They suffocated you with a sheet. They tied you to the bed. They tied me to the bed. A woman died next to me. Suffocated by her own vomit. She was tied down because she wouldn't stop masturbating. I remember her death rattle. I screamed, but nobody came. Everybody screamed in there. A whole lot of them. It was then that I saw that doll. Which wasn't Charlotte. No, she wasn't Charlotte. In the solitude of that crowded ward, the past came to harm me once more. He brought it with him. I would never have expected to see him. He had come there to remind me who I was. That's what my mother used to do. That's what I had done. It seems that my life in here is a repetition of what it was out of here. The doll, the fear, the shame. I should have liked to cancel everything I used to do, and instead I did it again, repeatedly. Monte Foscoli, 12th November, 1939. Dear daughter, it is with great sadness that I have heard what has happened. Your transfer and your sufferings are a cause of great worry for me. It will take time, but you'll see. Things will improve. They'll treat you and you'll get better again. I pray a lot, every day. Write to me often and tell me if you need anything. I'll do what I can. Try to be strong. Mom. This is the last letter she wrote me. Once I was put into this ward, loneliness arrived. After that medical examination, I received no more letters from Mum. Why is that man here? Why doesn't she come? Did I make a mistake? It didn't look like she wanted to abandon me. What did I do wrong? I should like to be able to reply to her again now to change things. Perhaps she would have listened to me. Will she reply? The letters were sent to the archive. It was their job to send them.
When you were sent to a lunatic asylum, you lost the right to possess anything. Everything you arrived with was packed up and stored here, even the clothes you were wearing, in case you were released one day. Too many, however, never left. There must be a file with my name in the filing cabinet, somewhere here. There must be a file with my name in the filing cabinet, somewhere here. Dear Mother, please, I beg you, get me out of this place. It frightens me so much. You were right. I know I was wrong. I realize I'm so ashamed. If you only knew how much. But now I'll behave well. Sure, now things will be fine. I'll work hard. I'll be very good. Your daughter, Renee. This letter. It was Renee's letter. Just like when it was written. But it was never sent. Why? Why did a thing like that happen? I've received your letter, Mum. You tell me to be patient and strong while I only have fear and pain and you no longer write to me. If only these lines could be my soul and tell you what's happening to me. The kids want to kill me. They all look the other way, and they tell me what I must do. I don't understand. She helps me, but what have they done to her? Can you tell me? Will you help me? Renee. Montefascoli, 7th July, 1940. My dear daughter, I have received no news from you. You haven't even dropped me a line for months. Unfortunately, I can't afford to come and visit you. I've no money for the fare. Do you remember Mr. Onofrio? He'll soon be coming to Volterra on business. I've asked him if would be kind enough to ask the director to have news about you. I hope when he comes back, he'll be able to give me good news. But write to me. I know that I was strict with you. You have to excuse me. I didn't realize. I've given Mr. Onofrio a new doll for you. You told me that you lost yours, and I know you loved it so much. It's not as nice as your Charlotte, but I hope that it will comfort you nonetheless. Keep your chin up, daughter. Things will be fine. You'll see. Mum. Montefascoli, 12th October, 1940. Dear daughter, I've written two letters to you and have received no reply. I await a letter anxiously every day. Mr. Onofrio has come back. He brought you the doll. Do you like it? He told me he didn't manage to speak to the director, but he did see you. I pray for you every day. Don Gino said a prayer for you during Sunday Mass. That was lovely, wasn't it? I've made up my mind, Renee. 
I'm going to bring you home. I've already written to the director. I told him that I'll take care of you. At the moment, I'm not well and can't work, but I'll soon get better. You'll see as soon as I'm up to making the journey, I'll come and get you. I know you're suffering a lot, but bear up. I beg you. Mom will come to pick us up, won't she? Mom is good, but she's not well. That's why that man came. She also sent us the doll. I could have played with it and talked to it, waiting for her to come. But Renee never brought it with her. Perhaps she has been kidnapped like all the others and will be locked up here somewhere. Let's look for the second doll. It'll be among bundles of the patient's things. Now we can open the bundle on that table in front of the window. See, Mom was good. I was bad. Mom was worried about Renee and Charlotte. I abandoned Charlotte. We've abandoned her. Let's look for Charlotte. We have abandoned her. She will always remain where we abandoned her. Beneath the hot lights... Thank <laughs> you. 
I didn't do anything. I only obeyed orders. Shame us on the way. I didn't come to us now. Shame us on the way. I only obeyed orders. Leave us alone. Shame us on the way. I only obeyed orders. No one will come and get us now. I didn't do anything. I only obeyed orders. Even though we're bad. Mom won't leave us alone. I didn't do anything. Charlotte gone away. I only obeyed orders. Mom will come and get us now. She loves us, even though we're bad. I didn't do anything. I only obeyed orders. What was that doctor writing, sitting at his desk? Seventh September, 1938. The patient frequently indulges in recriminations expressed in an explosive tone of voice. This morning she threw away the milk, saying it was full of urine, spittle, and all the other filth. Praised, she hears voices. They order her about. She says she heard children singing. They were imprisoned in a school. 20th January, 1939. Mutistic, groggy, pays no attention to anything. When questioned and stimulated, she starts crying and weeping. At other times, she laughs. 1st June. Apathetic, eats very little, she refuses to be touched. Doesn't respond. Passes her time in the park. The cooks report that she sits on a bench in front of the kitchens. 14 October. Impulsive once again. This morning, she asked for two eggs to make zabaglioni, 
but the moment she was given them, she threw them away. Excited, uproarious, slightly confused, she strips off. 8th December. Tied to bed for 15 days. High-spirited, tends to make witty comments and use vulgar words, laughs hysterically, masturbates. The nurses report that about two weeks ago she remained in the showers on her own and didn't want to leave. They report that when they took her away she swore at them and then hit out at them and bit them. Two nurses had to be treated for their injuries. Since then they've kept her tied to the bed. Transferred to the semi-agitated ward. From the care of Dr. B to the care of Dr. C. I was with Amara in the showers. My memories terrify me. They're not real, are they? Fifteenth December. Dr. C. Patient Notes. The abnormality of her psychic state has induced her to lead a life which is irregular and tends towards delinquency. A fickle and flighty character, she abandons her household duties at intervals and dabbles in occasional prostitution. Delinquency! Maybe I answered someone back rudely, yeah, at times they get on my nerves, but delinquency? And the prostitution? No, why? Why say a thing like that? The old doctor tried to understand, but this one just brands you without even understanding. Or even trying to understand. Her mental deficiency makes her deaf to the reprimands of her family. She has shown suicidal tendencies. She was brought to the ward yesterday, agitated and vociferous. Treated with cardizol. Two injections a week for five weeks. The therapies remove the light for a short while, but also all will, desire and hope. 's torture, but you couldn't refuse it. No one explained anything to us. No one tried to make us understand. We were like animals on a stock farm. Second June. After a long period of calm and improvement, the patient is very agitated today and vehemently refuses to submit to a gynecological examination. She swore and cursed those who generated her, flailing her arms and hitting out. The patient, according to reports by Dr. B, has been subjected to periodic checkups since she had a spontaneous abortion about two years ago in her third month of pregnancy. Conception occurred after she had sexual intercourse with a stranger who sneaked into the hospital park. As detailed in the charges filed at police headquarters in Volterra, a copy of which is attached to these clinical notes. ES therapy. Spontaneous abortion? It's not true, I'm certain. How could I have invented things if I didn't even know what they were doing to me? Thirteenth June. The nurses report that after having received her mother's letter, she fell into a state of great mental confusion. She threw her soup over another inmate because she was very anxious, and she punched a nurse. Impulsive, lashes about her. She rails against the doctor in vulgar terms while he is examining her. Lashes out and spits. Block all correspondence so as not to give the patient further reasons to become agitated. 20th August, tied to bed. The nurses report that the patient becomes highly agitated after the visit of a relative or family friend. Even two days later, she still shouts ceaselessly that he commands her, that she must obey and harm herself and that she is not Charlotte. All visits forbidden, constrained to bed and intensification of ES therapy until we achieve results. No contact with the exterior. In that way, no one knew what was happening within these walls. 3rd March. 
alert, correct attitude replies when questioned. The nurses report that the patient is calm. She washes and looks after herself. She affirms the existence of a certain Amara. She says that Amara is a patient who disappeared when she was moved to this ward. No confirmation. Probably a regressive hallucination. Evaluate transfer. Amara invented by me? That's not possible. She was there. I know she was there. I feel it. She must have left traces somewhere. We can try to find her medical records in the archive where the letters from her mother were filed. Amara B, age 32, housewife, mother of two daughters, married to Mario B. So Amara exists then, yet she had no children. She wasn't married, but that photo, it's her. 3rd June, 1936, admitted yesterday, she shows signs of improvement. 10th June, jolly, calm, tranquil, she behaves well. Keeps herself tidy and clean. Discharged 8th June. 28th April 1937. Arrives, brought by her husband, in an anxious and nervous state. Has difficulty speaking, trembles. Discharged 14th May. 8th March 1938. A few days before Renee was admitted, she told me that she had also been admitted shortly before. Arrived yesterday in a febrile state. Discharged 14th March. She didn't leave. Certainly not after so few days, no. June 22, 1939. Readmitted. Once more the patient shows rapid improvement. Discharged 2nd July. 1st August 1941. Umpteenth admission due to agitation. Discharged 27th August. She came and went. Stayed there only for short periods. But I remember her always with me. What's happening? 4th March 1942. Here once more, the same situation. 8th March. Compared with previous admissions, the patient seems depressed even after a few days, although she bears herself well and is attentive. Discharged 25th March. 2nd April. The patient is distracted and apathetic. Her husband brought her because she doesn't eat, doctor. Sleeps all the time. I'm so worried, doctor. You know her. You can help her. 6th April. Tuberculosis. Patient transferred to Margliano Pavilion, in isolation. 3rd May 1942. Death due to tuberculosis, about 8.30. Is Amara dead? Poor dear friend, I wasn't even able to say goodbye to you. Enclosed is a manuscript written by the patient, probably delirium. I'm dying, I know it. I'm losing lots of blood, also internally. It's strange, since I came back in here, I can't think of anything other than that little girl with her sad eyes, her desperation. I only saw her for a short time, true, but she remains in my heart. Will she still be here? I hope to God not. I hope she's better and her mother's taken her home. My memories don't correspond. What's the point of this? Perhaps my memory is deceiving me. The things are not as I remember, as I see them. But she said she liked me. Really, I can't understand it. I just want to say goodbye to her for the last time. I never even said goodbye to her. How could a soul survive in this hell? I wish to feel things again. Pain, passion. Once again feel the tears wet in my face. Remember to have lived.
I can't be sure it's Amara's. These crosses are nameless. How will we ever know whose they are? There are no names. We were worth nothing. In death as in life. If there was someone out there who cared for you, well, perhaps... I had Mom. Let's go and wait for her. She'll come and get us. She promised. Let's wait for Mum in the waiting room. Mom will come. She'll come. She promised and will come to get us. She'll take us home. Now I understand. I won't misbehave anymore. Behave again, Mom. Don't leave me here, please. I won't bother anyone. I'll be quiet in my corner. How I really miss that dark corner where I used to pass entire days. I'll stay there like a good little girl, but take me away from this place. I must always concentrate on nothingness. Otherwise, I get confused and I'm afraid I won't be able to find my way back. Any thoughts upset me in an incredible manner, which I'm not able to cope with. I'm afraid of myself of what I might do when I get confused and don't remember. There are some hurts which I'm not aware of. Those are the hurts which cause me the greatest embarrassment. I wish I could close myself away in a shell, in my little corner. See no more, hear no more, no longer exist. 
Mom, take me away. I beg you. What if she's already been? If she's already gone away? Let's check in reception. Miss, please send the following telegram to Ada T. Discharge of Renee T. Impossible. Psychiatric evaluation negative. This is a sentence of life imprisonment. I can't spend all my life in here. I can't. It's a death sentence.
Mr. Onofrio is very kind and helps us. If he's not there, you've got reason to be afraid. place is this? Maybe I'm dead. I can't see any light. I might be dead. I can't get up. What's going on here? What's happening to me? There's no one here. Yet, these noises... God, my head is killing me. I can't keep my eyes open. May 1942. In the past, the patient had expressed suicidal intentions, never carrying out her intentions. Yesterday, she injured herself badly, stabbing herself in the stomach with sharp pointed scissors. Sedated, restrained, and transferred to a restraining cell. 10th May. Transferred to the agitated ward for observation. Isolation, insulin shock therapy. 25th September. Positive response to treatment. 
She replies to questions and remembers what happened, but doesn't want to give explanations. She claims to have memory lapses, but can tell ideas about what she remembers now. She appears to be anxious and seeks reassurance. She appears to have done monstrous things in the periods of which she has no memory. Eleventh November, nineteen forty two. The patient speaks very little, refuses food, force fed with nasal cannula. Second February, nineteen forty three. The lack of kerosene for heating and the shortage of sufficient food is causing a lot of victims in the institution. War spares nobody, not even these alienated creatures. Despite her young age, this patient has become ill because of the cold and the war. In here, nobody laughs. I mean, really laughs. Not those crazy fools who laugh because people say they are mad. I don't know why, because they do really laugh. They say that I'm mad too, but I never feel like laughing. In the past, people laughed at me, but they were right, you know? You can't always cry, and people laugh when they are afraid, don't they? It happened to you, not to me, better so. In short, they do that to show that they're happy. You oughtn't to be offended because it's true and deep down it's just like having pity, so to speak. But then you think about yourself and so you laugh to say that it's okay. Everything will get better, that it's all shit. It's all shit this place. You're not trying to tell me that it's not true, right? An intelligent person, educated, not like me. And if I can see that it's a load of shit, just imagine how much better you understand. No, come on. No, 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 I feel fine here, you know? After all, I can do anything I want or say anything I want. No, come on. No, no, no. I feel fine here. After all, I can do anything I want or say anything I want. August 1942. We hereby communicate the death of Ada T., mother of Renee T., her patient in your institution. No known relative. Sincerely yours, Onofrio P. I've nobody left in the world. Nobody at all. Solitude is very strange. It muffles everything, slows it down. It's an endless scream which doesn't emit any sound. A silent shout. I can't stop looking at myself. I will never leave this place. There's nobody for me out there. These walls have become my skin, and the wretched desperation within them is my soul without a voice. Here, nobody weeps anymore. How I would love to feel life, desperation, anger. I've stopped dreaming daydreaming, maybe even thinking. I've lived in a reality which has corroded me, depriving me of everything, even of my capacity to feel pain.
5th May, 1943. Renee's in a good state of health. She eats and speaks. Is orientated in space and time. Therapy suspended. 3rd December. She asks reasonably if she can leave the hospital. Evaluate patient for six months. 2nd May, 1944. Discharge denied, despite favorable psychiatric opinion. Patient has no home or means of support. 4th May. The reasons why discharge is impossible are explained. And in this manner, Renee learns of her mother's death, two years after the fact. 5th May. During the night, she tried to kill herself by hanging herself with a sheet, saved by the nurses. Restrained to her bed, she once more tries to kill herself by suffocation. It is decided to perform a transorbital lobotomy.
10th of June, 1944. Operation successful. Patient tranquil and collaborative. Motor coordination capacity reduced, but she's improving. Transfer to the tranquil department in the care of Dr. B. 25th of October. Continues to talk about Amara and her doll, Charlotte. The disturbances of motor capacity show slight signs of improvement. Difficulty walking. Not capable of riding. And the nurses report that they have to help her dress, wash, and feed herself. In the summer of 1944, Renee was transferred back into my department. Aware of little, indifferent, hardly ever spoke. One day, she said, when I find the courage to look at myself in the mirror, I see a young face which is aged and looks at me full of fear. She is a woman now who has changed profoundly compared to the girl that I had under my care several years ago. Only the sadness of her gaze and her intelligence are unchanged. She's so young, just 23 years old, but is lacking all vitality. Perhaps her condition may improve, but probably not. Her life has been thrown away. And nobody did a thing to try to avoid this. This is